I'm sorry, peace, friends. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Mikkel White, and sometimes I forget to turn my mic back on. I'm the pastor here of the South Lansing campus of Sycamore Creek Church. <laughs> uh, Teresa Miller is my co-host this morning. Yeah. <laughs> I love having it. Yeah, yay! Co-hosts Thank are so you. fun because they like. Then you get to hear from people who aren't me and know that like. Like, we have conversations, and it's great, and um, mm -hmm. gives a little bit of depth to what we're doing. And Jen is our worship leader this morning. Yay! Um, I've got a quick shout-out question for you. You can just shout out your answer to this. What is the farthest from home you've ever been? California. California, Australia. Germany, Australia, South Korea. My, my answer is Malawi. In Africa, I went there the summer I turned 15, so that's been a minute. Uh, and this is funny. This is from a Lord of the Rings uh, meme. This is it. If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. Maybe you've had that experience, too. Uh, would you stand with me? We're going to sing a couple of songs this morning. How's everybody feeling this morning? Good. I'm a little craggy, so uh, one of the things I noticed last week is that you guys were so loud singing. We're going to need that today, okay? Okay. spoke a word, you were singing over me. You 
Our next song, It Is Well, um, I did this one a couple weeks ago, and it was the first time I ever sang that song, well, first time I ever heard that song, and I really loved it. Um, I don't know where you guys are in your lives, but sometimes mine is messy, and we've had a lot of stuff going on, but it's nice to know. At the end of it all, it is well. God's got us. He's got you. 
got me. And so let's sing this together. Oh, not if it all falls off the music stand, though. Uh -oh. That'll be bad. <laughs> Stay there. It was. Grand earth has quaked before Moved by the soundless voice Season all shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard and Through it all mountain that's in front of me that will be thrown into the midst of the sea and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and through it all through it all it is well and through it all through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well, it is well. So let it go, my soul, and trust in him, the waves and wind still know his name. Let it go. My soul and trust in him. The ways and wind still know his name. The ways and wind still know his name as well. And it is well.
am so thankful. You can have a seat. I'm so thankful to have musicians in our community, in our congregation. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh. Thank you. <sighs> okay, kids, you can go on up to Kids Creek now. Go have fun. <laughs> go eat snacks. Have fun. It's good. Good times. Go ahead and in your program, you'll see um, the connection card. Go ahead and start filling that out. And we're going to refer to this a little bit later in the service. Yeah. And everybody can fill this out. Everybody. It's for everybody. Okay. Um, then we've got selfie of the week time. So pull out your phone. We like to... Like this, this is like a way of saying, hey guys, if you're looking for, we, we post this on social media. You post your selfie to social media with hashtag SCCMI, or you can tag us on Instagram. And this is a way of like letting people know if they're looking for a faith community, they can ask you about where you go. Also, if you're selected to be the selfie of the week, did you know that you get a Big B gift card? You get a Big B gift card in the mail, so. Gotten a few of those. You've gotten a few, yeah, I bet you have. <laughs> All right. Okay, and if you don't have social media, you can always email it to us at the office at sycamorecreekchurch.org. Um, our selfie of the week this week is Gretchen Williams and Star Lalone and Chad Swan Badgero. Look at them. That's so cute. It's such a sweet. Thank you. So who gets the gift card when there's three of them in there? All three of them. Oh, that's cool. Although typically we don't send it to staff, so Star might not get it because oh. she's on staff. Um, but Chad is uh, the, the founder and the visionary for Peppermint Creek Theater Company, and they, like, they have a show this week at our Eastwood campus. Yep, going this afternoon. We're going this afternoon. It's going to be amazing. So anyways, take a selfie. Post it to your social medias, tag us in it. This week we're starting a new series. Uh, it's called The Space Between Us, and it's about like connecting with people and like building bridges across differences, which, you know, we thought might be helpful. <laughs> you know that thing we don't talk about when you're in certain groups? We don't talk about that. About. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about that this week, and uh, our message begins with this. Tension in our personal relationships are at an all-time high. Dialogue, when it happens at all, is heated. It isn't that we've lost hope in what faith and politics can accomplish in our world. It's that in our polarizing times, faith and politics seem to be leading more to rage than actual change. It's discouraging, disheartening, and disappointing. But it doesn't have to stay that way. Civility is not a pipe dream. Nuance is not unrecoverable. Peace is possible, and it can all start right here, right now, with us. Let's close the space between us. So you might know this, and you might not, but we, uh, so I'm on a team, like we have three campuses of Sycamore Creek Church, and the three of us, the pastors of the three campuses, we plan out our series, like, well in advance. In fact, this last week, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, we got together and we planned all of our sermons through like October of 2025. That's a long time from now. <laughs> uh, now, some of it might change as we get closer, like some of it is, is a little bit flexible, um, but it all kind of depends, right? Uh, it's a way of us being intentional about uh, making sure we're hitting a bunch of topics and covering a bunch of different things. And so in November of 2022... Uh, we got together and we, we chose our sermon series for like Easter of 23 to Easter of 24. And we knew that in 2024, there would be something happening in November that like might be a little disruptive. Maybe it's not Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you might know what I'm talking about here. Um, so, with the election coming up and, like, the dumpster fire that that can be, we thought it would be really helpful for us to have conversations about this so that we could have conversations with each other that build bridges instead of burning them. I mean, wouldn't that be nice, right? And so, we... 
we, we, we started looking for something. And the thing is that, like, because we planned this all so far out, we don't always read the books that we're planning to use before we plan to use them. But we'll, like, you know, look on who is, like, recommending this book. That can help us kind of know some things. And, and what is the table of contents? And, like, we, we try to do some research on it. Um, and so we, we found this book. Uh, it's called The Space Between Us. And, um, you know, fast forward to, like, January 2024, like, last month, last week, we are starting, no, we started this before last week, but like at the beginning of the year, we start reading this book and we realize that the, the foreword is written by Gary Bauer. Now, I'm too young to really know who that is, but I bet that some of you know who Gary Bauer is, uh, or maybe not. Quick Google search will show you that he was uh, Ronald Reagan's Undersecretary of Education the former president of the Family Research Council, the former senior vice president of Focus on the Family, a 2000 Republican presidential candidate, and currently the president of American Values. And so then we started, like, uh, did we make a big mistake? Like, is this gonna be really partisan? I mean, that was really the, the fear, is not so much that the person would have a different perspective, um, than what I might have or what you might have, but that like maybe it would be really partisan. And so we looked a little closer. It's, he is the father of the author, Sarah Bauer Anderson. Um, and so we're, we're reading through, we're, we're figuring this out. Um, she did grow up, obviously, very conservative, evangelical. In fact, her birthday was in July, and so she had... America-themed birthday parties. Um, she uh, participated in True Love Waits, which you know, I don't know how many of you would know what that is. That was a very evangelical thing. That was very popular. Yeah, when I was in high school, um, that's like where you commit to not have sex before you're married, um, and they like get high schoolers to sign up for that. And then also, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, which was a really popular book. Yeah, some of you remember. Some of you remember this book. Uh, it was about courting people instead of dating. I don't, I mean, sure. Uh, this guy, Joshua Harris, uh, he later kissed Christianity goodbye and then tried to sell a workshop on it, so that was fun. Um, so he, she says, Sarah Bauer Anderson says, by the time I graduated high school, I had become the poster child for what a teenager living in evangelical Christian subculture looked like, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But then she went to college, and her world got bigger, and she started to meet people who had different perspectives, who weren't like totally off the wall. She started to meet people who were in different traditions of Christianity, had different perspectives, different expressions of religion, and she found them compelling. She had really important experiences, and, and then all of a sudden, the political and, and social sort of perspectives that she had taken for granted no longer seemed really clearly obvious. And all of a sudden now, when her family gets together, they can no longer assume that everyone is on the same page, that everyone has the same perspective. And yet, their relationships have remained strong. So there, there's a challenge for us in that, right? Because it's kind of more comfortable to get together with people who have the same perspectives that you can kind of count on, like you can say that thing and no one's gonna challenge you on it. But it can be kind of boring. And and so this is a challenge. And so she's saying that, like, if I've managed, if we've managed to find a way forward in spite of what could drive us apart, there's hope for everyone. And I think this is a really beautiful vision of being able to have conflict with someone we love and still stay connected. I think this, I hope this, this is what we all want, to experience that kind of beauty, to experience those kinds of conversations. 
Now, one of the things we do here at Sycamore Creek is we'll pause throughout our message to have chat questions. This is an opportunity for you to process what we're talking about, also to reset your attention span. Um, for those who are joining us online, you can put this in the chat or you can turn to someone around you. You can even get up and move if you need to, to talk to someone. If you're really an introvert, it's okay. You don't have to talk to anybody. Okay, uh, but let's stop and talk about this question for just a minute. What is the political and spiritual landscape like in your family and social circles? Uh, let's take 90 seconds and chat about it. I don't know about you, but that 90 seconds went really <laughs> fast. I think this might be some conversations we continue, you know, and over they are lunch, continuing. and they are continuing, <laughs> and um, I feel like, it, I don't know, I, I grew up very similar to how I think Anderson grew up, um, and also my my family has changed. Uh, like, so it's not always clear who has what perspective or, you know, there, there's some of a, some of my siblings I feel like I can talk to and like we're on the same page and then other ones, sometimes I feel like I have to like kind of tiptoe around. I think we have to be careful putting labels on things. And yeah. I'm here to say I'm a conservative mm -hmm. and all of you just made a judgment. No one has talked to me in five years to ask me what I believe. Hmm. There's some pain there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, like, being curious about what we think instead of just, like, assuming that we know, um, I think that's a, a really helpful reminder to us to, like, ask questions and lean in. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're conservative, what does that mean to you? To me, living more by Christian values, the rule of law and order, mm -hmm. um, helping your neighbor, you know, lo loving each yeah. other, w reaching out and helping those that are in need. I think there's a lot there that, like, we could all agree on, that, like, we want mm -hmm. to love our neighbors and we want to, to live out that kind of ethic of, of following Jesus. So I think it will be really interesting and, and good, like hopeful for us to find those places of connection rather than focusing and on our differences. And we need to have con differences. <coughs> conversation and not do that judgment thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Isn't there only one judge? Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, so <clears throat> today we're, we're kicking off um, the series by talking about connection versus difference. Right, so how can we connect with each other instead of just staying distant from one another? Because there's a space between us. Anderson talks about this tradition in her family, and this is going to work for some people, and it's not going to work for others, and that's, that's okay. Um, where, like, they'll arrive at a family gathering, and there's either a tray of old fashions or a tray of Manhattans, <laughs> which sounds like, I don't know, I can't really imagine just making the same drink for everybody, but that's me. Um, and again, that's not going to be for everybody. 
Now, most of us think, right, that like alcohol is sort of a sensitive subject in Christian spaces and like probably there's not going to be any in heaven, right? Although the prophet Isaiah says uh, that in Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. Now, I'm pretty sure that doesn't mean that vegetarians and uh, sober people can't go to heaven. I, I don't think that's what it means. Um, but it's interesting to think about how some of those things can um, be part of a celebration and also be part of um, bringing some defenses down and helping us to connect with people in a different way. She says, I, I know it's just a drink, but sometimes this drink is what facilitates our, our defenses coming down our ties to one another being strengthened and our differences being put in perspective. There's something compelling about that. Now, and again, maybe for you it's not an alcoholic drink. Maybe it's a soft drink um, or hot cocoa in this weather. That's, um, I feel like that can be really helpful. Like The important thing is to find something that can help people relax and help those defenses come down. It makes me think about what dinners must have been like for Jesus' disciples. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Like, on one hand, yes, Jesus' disciples are all men and all Jewish. Um, so, in some ways, not a lot of diversity there. In other ways, like Matthew was a tax collector, which means he was a Jew who had sold out to the empire and was like in collusion with the empire and hurting his own people by collecting taxes. Whereas Judas was a radical, maybe sometimes violent, and a resistor to the empire. They had very different perspectives on how to interact with Rome. Peter was an impulsive early adopter of things, where Thomas was an imp uh, empirical skeptic. They had different ways of seeing the world, of interacting with people, of like processing things, and yet they had these dinners together. They were on mission together. Believe it or not, we're already at our next chat question. Oh, wait. Where, what did, okay, sorry. No, I got a quote first. I got a quote first. What if instead of trying to make us the same, what if instead of trying to make us all the same, we got better at understanding and appreciating where we're different? But if we, if we learn to practice compassion, what if we learn to co practice compassion in our differences instead of judgment? Instead of making snap judgments about what people believe, we lean in with compassion and curiosity. Like, just, like, actually imagine that for a minute. Like, what if we did that? What if we could do that? And not only us, like, what if we experience someone having that sense of curiosity to the us? I think that's really like powerful to think about and to imagine. And that's something I want to work to, to, toward, and I hope that you do too. So here is actually our chat question. Where have you been able to practice compassion in differences instead of judgment? And where have you struggled? Like, where, where is this, like, come naturally, and where is this a struggle for you? Let's take 90 seconds and talk about it.
I think this is difficult sometimes for us to like even step back and say like what experiences have I had recently or like what comes to mind um I think a place that I both have compassion and struggle is in talking about um like disability and like disability politics because I have like really strong opinions that I think are really important and we live it in our family uh and then on the other hand, I know that like a lot of people just haven't had the opportunity to think about it. So like I have a lot of compassion and then sometimes I'm like, ah! you know, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. I struggle with Facebook. Yeah. And um, I respect people have a right to say what they want to say. And my compassion is I don't delete them and eliminate them. Yeah but I feel I've not been listened to. I've never asked what I feel. I've told what I feel, hmm. and I'm eliminated. Hmm. Yeah. It can be hard to know how to show up in that space when you feel like you're not listened to mm -hmm. and that people aren't curious and like compassionate in how they respond to you. I mean, we all struggle with what is the truth. Sure. That there, there, that could be another whole sermon on itself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's hard, and it's hard to like keep showing up in that space and stay soft when you're you're feeling that way and feeling like you're not valued. So, thank you for being here and for sharing your perspective. Thank you for asking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mentioned earlier that we are part of three campuses and. Um, Tom, Pastor Tom over at Eastwood, he uh, filmed the online version of this message, and it was actually a conversation that he had with someone uh, called Matthew Anderson, uh, and I, I want to like give you a chance to hear from him and, and hear part of their conversation, so this next segment is going to be uh, the part of a conversation that they had uh, about this topic, so we'll, we'll continue on. So I have a great example of when I totally blew this. Absolutely blew it. Um, didn't respond with compassion at all. Was with my family and another family member needed to go to urgent care. And one of my family members, when we were looking at the different urgent cares in the region or area said, don't go to that one. That's where the Mexicans go to. And <coughs> my kids were in the room and I just jumped on this family member. Yeah, right. Like, and, and I, I think that from the left, that's what you, you're told to do. Like, you can't stay silent. Right. You have to say something. You can't let your kids hear that kind of thing and it just go past. But what I ended up doing really was just shaming this family member. Yeah. And all they did was just shut up. Yeah. The, there was, it, the conversation was over. Yeah. They said their thing. I shamed them. And then it was done. And then it was just like, the, it was awkward. Yep. So a little bit later on in the day when this family member and I had a chance just to be alone together. I went back to him and I said, you know what, I'm really sorry I shamed you. Yeah. Um, that wasn't the best way to handle that. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. And it was interesting because at that point, when I actually showed some compassion for them, they said to me, you know, I don't know why that came out of my mouth. Sure, yeah. And I felt a little bit at that moment like I had lost any kind of moral <laughs> ground to stand on to explore that with them. Sure. But that was a, that was a, that was a good, like, I think that it was a, it was a better second response than it was my first response. Yeah. My first response was uh, judgment, shame. My second response was compassion. Yeah. And right. it elicited compassion. Yep. How about you? Have you had an experience, struggle, or were yeah. you done you know, as well? So during COVID, I, I had a real challenge with, um, we had a couple, couple, instances around holidays and special occasions that just coincidentally we had COVID flare-up issues in you know kind of our greater family mm -hmm. and so a couple of years in a row you know the first year everything was messed up but you know those following couple of years things didn't necessarily get to come back together for my extended family mm -hmm. because we had so many variables at play and I remember there was there was a point in time where I I handled it really really poorly um, in the moment I felt I handled it correctly in the moment in the moment, I felt I was 
right and vindicated and following the rules per CDC as they were that day or week. You know, things changed very regularly then. Um, Many of us use CDC as sledgehammers against our family members. That's what I did. Yeah. Right. And like I was right in what I was doing and you are being foolish in what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And those two things don't align. And, and that was my mentality at the time. There was not really compassion as much as trying to be right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have the, didn't have the permission really in the relationship in that moment with that individual to have that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was really the miss for me was understanding like, you can be right and still be wrong. <laughs> and, and that was the case that happened here. It caused damage, damage that, you know, there's still some damage I'm trying to fix, you know, a yeah. couple, couple of years yeah. later. And, um, and so that, that's a moment for me that was, that was hard where I believed in the moment I was doing the right mm -hmm. thing. Kind of like what you, you know, you, you're, you're responding, you know, silence is compliance, right? And, or, mm -hmm. and, and we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna do that, but also we can't hurt people. And so that's, that's the time where I really did yeah. struggle. And I, and I do struggle with, I want to serve everybody as much as possible. And sometimes that costs a person and, that's not helpful either, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. for that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, how do you build a bridge in that moment rather than put up a wall? Yeah. Yeah. Um, your whole idea about how you can be right but still be wrong reminds me of my early church history <laughs> class, Christian history class, um, when we were exploring the heresies and yeah. orthodoxy. Uh, our professor said like that one of the guys, uh, one of the church leaders who ended up winning the argument it was a real SOB. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> just a total jerk. Right. And you know, Jesus said like, well, if you actually, Paul, Jesus and Paul both said, hey, if you don't have love, then it doesn't matter. Like you, you're missing something. That's exactly Huge, it. important. And, and I was, in that moment, I was focusing just on facts, just on reality, and I wasn't focusing on the love side at all. And, and that was literally the only thing missing. You're right. Yeah. Again, I go back to Anderson. She's got a lot of wisdom in mm. this whole thing. And here's what she says. We've been asking, how do I get others to change their minds, see as I do, come to my side and be like me, but what if instead we started asking, how can we begin to close the space between us? So then she gets really practical. Cool. She gives us some tips, three cool. tips that we're gonna walk through here. The first one is this, be aware of the background noise. Anderson says, keep in mind all the things that make these relationships tense besides the topics being addressed. Mm. So we're talking here about patterns of conflict in yeah. your family that don't have anything to do with the immediate issue at hand or family histories or, you know, you can just think about the whole, like, what is, what, what happened in your family? All the trauma in the past, your parents, your grandparents, your trauma, everything that comes together. So we're going to stop again and let people talk about that. And then we're going to talk about it. So here's a question for you. When you have political conversations with your family or loved ones, what's some of the background noise? Let's talk about that. All right. Such easy questions. Such an easy question. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I think um, I mentioned earlier that, like, I grew up very evangelical, uh, and now 
like my perspectives have changed. Um, so th there's like this churning, I think, that's happening like in my family where like a lot of us have changed. So it's not, it's not like anybody gets shut down when they express, express different perspectives. Um, there, there's some family members that I feel like when I try to have like a, uh, I'm trying to be really careful how I talk about <laughs> stuff, you know, because sometimes they watch. <laughs> um, no, love you, mom and dad. <laughs> um, no, so like, I, I just think there's like, it can be hard to really feel like you're connecting and being heard. And like that you're also listening, which I think is part of what you were talking about too. Right, and I'm thinking, oh great, now you all think I'm shaming you and that's <laughs> not where I'm coming from after listening to Tom. But we have to be able to talk to each other and to listen. Mm -hmm. And if we can't do it here, then the world's not gonna get any better. Yeah. And I think it's you know great to be talking about this at this point and being more aware maybe of that background noise you know, as I read this, I was kind of struggling, well, what does that mean? But it's all those beliefs that we carry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the 50s and 60s, even in the 70s, the churches were all pretty conservative. And then we've grown as we've learned and life has changed. And, you know, we, yeah. we, if we can't accept each other, then... Yeah, I think that background noise is also, like, the ways that the patterns of communication that you have and that, like, uh, I'm the third-born child, so I'm, the like, the baby girl. Um, I'm the third out of fourth, but then I have some, like, first-child tendencies. And so, like, then the way that I interact with people in my family is, like, reflects those things. When my sisters say, oh, someone should talk to so-and-so about this, what they mean is, Mikkel, can you talk to so-and-so about this? <laughs> So that's like the role that I play in my family, and I think that's, that's also part of that background noise is like, ugh, you got to be aware of those, those patterns of communication and like problem solving that you have in your family. And I'm a firstborn, so I'm the snowplow. <laughs> You're like, let's get it done. And the older I get, the more I'm willing to say what I think. <laughs> oh, yep, yep, I can feel that. So I think um, one of the things that she says, I, I love this quote. I've learned that one of the trickiest things about becoming an adult is learning how to bring my adult self into childhood relationships. So those childhood relationships are the relationships you had when you were a child with your parents, with your siblings, with the people you grew up with, with your aunt and uncle, right, or whoever, who knew you as a child, saw you when your brain was not fully formed, and then developed ideas about who you were as a person. And now, so many years later, you've changed. You're not the same person you were when you were nine years old, right? And, and yet, it's difficult for people who watch you grow up to, to make space for that change to happen. And it's difficult for us, right, for me to like go into that and not revert back to who I was as a 12-year-old or 13 or, or whatever, right? And I mean, we see this, like I see this when, actually, I'm not gonna throw you under the bus, Nathan, my husband, but like sometimes I see this when we go, when we travel to each other's houses. Like I see him reverting back to some of the dynamic, like his role in his family. He probably sees that really clearly in me, right? In a way that I don't see it in myself. So that, the point was, yeah, the point was really that sometimes you see it more clearly in other people than you do in yourself. Um, woo. <laughs> All right, so our, our second tip for connection versus difference is to change your metric for success. Okay, so what, what we're talking about here is like, is your metric for success, for a successful conversation, that the person believes what you believe? Is, your, is it a successful conversation if you get them to change their mind? Or is it a successful conversation if you understand each other better? if you've heard each other, if, you, if you've engaged with curiosity and compassion and creativity, right? Are we going for a vote as I vote or hear me and be heard, right? Like what, are, what is our metric for success? 
A few years ago, Sycamore Creek did a series called I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening. This predates my time here. Um, but but the, it's based on a book, yeah. And it's about having grace-filled political conversations where we can say, I think you're wrong, but I want to understand what you're talking about. I want to hear what you're talking about. It reminds me, um, last year sometime, I don't know, time is weird, um, we did a workshop called uh, Reset, Resetting the Table Workshop. And this was two weeks uh, where a group of people who were intentionally had different perspectives got together and we talked about stuff, um, the different things that had shaped our perspectives. And one of the, the exercises that we did was the bullseye exercise. So a person would share for like two or three minutes a perspective that they have on like a political thing. And um, the people in the group, there would be like three people in the group, would... Their goal was to repeat back, so you're saying this. I, like, did I get it? Like, they want to repeat back in their own words what that person said. Now, this got tricky, because sometimes we, like, it's so hard not to be, like, evaluative. Like, I agree with you. I think that's a good point. Like, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to say, did I get right what you said? Did I get it right? Was it a bullseye? Did I reflect back to you what you said? That can be a really, really helpful sort of framework for this, right? So as we're talking about things that are we're different, like my goal is not to change your mind, but to understand you. Did I get it right? Did I reflect back to you what you, what you said? Now, Tom and uh, Matthew mentioned this, like this can be tricky for us because sometimes we think, is my silence here really complicity? Right? Like, if I have an idea of something and I don't speak up, does that mean that I'm agreeing? If, if you're wondering that, you should know that, like, God processed this too. Uh, God said, while you did all this, he's talking to the people of Israel, I remained silent, and you thought I didn't care. You thought it wasn't a big deal to me because I didn't say anything. Now, the passage goes on, like, God did eventually speak up, God did eventually address it, and so you should know that there's, like, times to be silent, and there are times to speak up, and to say, I think you're wrong, but I'm listening, right? Um, so, but I think it's really helpful to know, like, God wrestled with that, too. Like, we're in good company when we think about that. Our, our third tip is to debrief and learn, now, debriefing and learning about these conversations, like, we have a culture of debrief here at Sycamore Creek. Like, we're often after a big event or, like, a holiday season or almost any meeting that you go to will end by talking, by asking what went well. Like, we start with celebrating because um, not all of us are good at, like, celebrating the good things and noticing the good things. That's me. Maybe you're like that too, but I have a hard time with that. I very quickly go to, I should have done this, and I should have done that, and I messed that up. Can you believe I didn't know that that quote was going on, and I went right to the chat question? Like, like that's how my brain works. Maybe yours does work like that too. Um, but w So we'll start with celebrating, and then we'll talk about uh, what was missing or confusing or needed improvement. We'll ask those questions, and Debriefing these kinds of conversations, like, I mean, you would need a lot of trust to do that with your conversation partner. You might not always be able to do that, but you can have that personal reflection and you can ask yourself, okay, in that conversation, what did I do well? What, what went well about that conversation? Did the person feel heard? Did they feel understood? Did I gain new perspective on what they think? What, 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 what could have been improved? Where, where could I have shown um, a better curiosity or more compassion? You can even ask yourself, like, what could they improve? Although you might or might not share that with them, depending on your relationship, right? So, like, these are things that we can do to just process and continue to learn and improve on having these conversations. Anderson says, based on our experience, I'm absolutely convinced, against all odds, 
that it's possible to move toward one another when distance seems inevitable and connection feels impractical. How many of us have felt that this is impractical and that distance is inevitable in these conversations? And yet, what if connection is possible? What if we can actually connect with people? That gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot of hope. Um, we, we have, by the way, in our groups and events catalog, uh, Courageous Conversations workshop coming up starts March 16th. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to practice this kind of conversation. Um, it's a series of four Saturday mornings. And so if that's something that you're interested in, like actually practicing uh, and getting better at, check that out. You can write it on your connection card. I'm interested in the Courageous Conversations workshop. Um, but as we close today, like we're Sycamore Creek. Probably you've picked this up. We are pretty informal here. Uh, we don't tend to do formal liturgy. Um, liturgy is another word for like the, the worship structure um, and, and the things that we do. And so, uh, but in this book, she has a liturgy for connection, for crossing the space between us. And so we're going to do this. Um, for each line, like the top line, I'm going to say, and then you'll repeat back, or you'll say back, Lord, we give thanks. Like you'll do the part that's italicized. Does that make sense? Everybody got it? Yeah, you're pros. Okay. All right. I feel like, let's just take a deep breath, though. <laughs> For family near and peaceable, Lord, we give thanks. For family far and conflicted, Lord, we give thanks. For the ones easy to love, Lord, we give thanks. For the ones we fight to love, Lord, we give thanks. For people who see as we see, Lord, we give thanks. For people who don't understand, Lord, we give thanks. For people who don't understand us, Lord, we give thanks. For easy conversation and expressed affection, Lord, we give thanks. For gentle discord within our discourse, Lord, we give thanks. For unity, not sameness, Lord, we give thanks. For charity in all things, Lord, we give thanks. For a world that reflects your goodness, Lord, we give thanks. For humankind that bears your image, Lord, we give thanks. For a day when we'll delight in our differences and not just tolerate them, for a gathering of every tribe and every tongue, for a table and a feast today, anticipating the one we'll enjoy with you someday. Lord, we give thanks. Amen. We would love, obviously, to connect with you. We think that you might be here wanting to connect with us. So um, let's watch this video. It is going to be a shift in our like sort of tone. Um, because we like to be creative and have fun with our video announcements. So enjoy this. Hello, Hello and welcome to another exciting announcement video with me, Carola, and this is your connection card, your one-stop shop to connect with us. Leave us your name and email at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect by scanning the QR code or filling out the card and putting it in the buckets by your seat. Flip that bad boy over and take the next steps, like growing by reading The Space Between Us or joining us for the Lunch and Learn next week. The Lunch and Learn, where we will watch Redemption, the John M. Perkins story. We will eat lunch together and watch the documentary and debrief after worship on February 11th. That's next week. And today is the last day to register with your partner or spouse at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash marriage retreat for the two-day, one in person and one online marriage retreat. Grow in your relationship this February. If you're looking for a way to serve the community, look no further than the South Lansing Gas Giveaway this Mardi Gras, February 13th. From 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m., we'll be giving away $10 of free gas here at the South Lansing campus and next door. 
and register for communities organizing for racial equity virtual understanding racism workshop register today at corenow.org for the workshop february 21st 28th and march and coming up in march thank you for your giving that makes everything here possible at sycamore creek you can continue to give online at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give in the blue buckets and the envelopes by your seat or through mail our app and so many other ways let's take it back now to pastor Mikel to see what your giving has made possible all right so as the video said as carla said pull out that connection card flip it over We've got next steps. There's also a place here where you can write a prayer request. If there's something going on in your life and you just would like some support or people praying for you, fill that out. Our prayer team will be praying for you. Um, and also, there is a question here on the connection card. Um, this is a way, like, we want to get sort of a baseline understanding of, like, how prepared you are for the, like, winter holiday season, like Thanksgiving and Christmas of 2024, navigating relationships, navigating conversations about politics. Do you feel like really comfortable going into that? Or are you feeling a little bit unsure of that? Not very prepared. Please fill that out for us um, because our goal is to help you be more prepared. And this is a way that we can like get a baseline understanding so that we can like measure like are people growing or like are, are people more like prepared after the work that we do um so just fill that out for us please uh we will not like connect your name to your answer so don't worry about that okay and uh the lunch and learn is on here that's next week it's going to be like an hour so it's going to be pretty short and sweet and um I mean, the Lions are not in the Super Bowl. It's not going to interfere oh. with your Super Bowl plans. But it won't. It won't interfere with that. <laughs> um, and then she mentioned CORE in the video and, like, signing up at CORE now. And you can sign up. Also, we will subsidize the registration cost. So if you, if you check it on your box here or send me an email, then I will send you a link so that, like, you don't have to pay the full cost. Uh, so we'll subsidize that. So just so you know, fill that out. Okay. Well, and this Friday starts the marriage retreat. And if you haven't signed up, today's the last day today, to do it. Today. It's not on here, but just write marriage retreat. Uh -huh. um, there was this long address yeah. that is hard to remember. Uh, but sign it up on here or real quick. Take mm -hmm. a picture of that and get signed up today so you yeah. can be a part of it. It's going to start at Buddy's with dinner and things on Friday night. And then Saturday is going to be in the comfort of your home. I can yep. wear my fuzzy pants and don't worry about going out. Yeah. And um, it goes to about three. So yeah, it's going to be, be a part really of cool. It. Really cool. Um, also, oh, I forgot to tell you what to do with these connection cards. They go in the blue buckets at the end of your row. Um, if you have giving, that can go there too, or you can give online through the QR code or the website. Uh, this week, we're celebrating our community partners. So this is like some of like what your money goes toward helping is like we have these community partners. Um, Peppermint Creek Theater Company uh, uses our basement to rehearse, and then they go over to our Eastwood campus to perform. And this week, they, uh, this weekend and next weekend, their show, uh, How to Defend Yourself, is going on at Eastwood, stage I one. I think it was cool how you shared that they actually pay a little bit in rent, mm -hmm. and that helped to do the work downstairs yeah. to get the new flooring and all that put together. So I think that's really cool. And what good's an empty building? Let's use it and right. support our communities. Right. The the group that's rehearsing downstairs now it's from they're from Ixion, and she said that before they came over here, they were doing readings at the library for their like production like can you imagine trying to like work on a play in a library like study room huh probably <laughs> she said they were I like How do you smuggling be food in and out because they weren't supposed to have food in there so they like smuggled it in and then like had to smuggle and I was like you can have food downstairs it's no problem so 
thank you for your giving. Um, it helps move the mission forward. It helps partner with um, community theater groups who are bringing art, who are bringing um, topics that make us reflect. It's just great stuff. Our last chat question, or shout out question, so you're gonna shout this out. Does absence truly make the heart grow fonder? I do not know. <laughs> That's my son. That's my son. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if you think yes, raise your hand. If you think no, raise your hand. If you think it's more complicated than that, raise two hands. Yes. Yes. All right. I think that's most everybody. All right. Would you stand with me and let's sing together. I don't know about you guys, but I am super geeked about this series. That was awesome, right? The way that we think about things, the way that we learn things. So now let's sing. Oh, if I can figure it out. Where you go, I'll go. Well, that's not the right key, folks. <laughs> I'm going to play through it just a second. Sorry. I got it now. We can do this, right? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. folks and I apologize. Hopefully I can do this next one a little bit better because I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Lou, my husband right here in the front row, uh, was a pastor at a, this church in this little town in Wisconsin and he was doing this sermon once on kind of a similar topic on how we focus on each other and so I wrote this song and it kind of fits perfectly here because it's important for us to remember that at the end of the day, 
It's not whether you're right or left or up or down or anything else. It's what's on the inside. It's our uniqueness and our you-ness that we connect to and we love. So this is called I Like You. You should be able to pick it up pretty easy, I hope. What's in your eyes? I like you. I like what's in your. Oh, these aren't the right words. There we go. Sorry, we're gonna start that over. I like you. I like the way you smile. I like you. I've liked you for a while. Yes, I do. Oh, you know I like you. Let's try that again. I like you. I like the way you smile. I like you. I've liked you for a while. Yes, I do. Oh, you know I like you. It's not the clothes that you wear. It's not the things that you do. Not the stuff that you got, no. It's the unis of you. I like you. I like what's in your eyes. I like you. I've liked you for a lifetime, maybe too. Oh, you know I like you. Your heart and your soul. Inside your out, your ups and your downs, oh, your face and your downs. I like you, do baby, do do. Oh, you know I like you. Yes, I do. That was such a fun song. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks for joining us this morning. I hope that you'll come back next week. You're in for a treat next week because we will have a conversation sermon live with myself and Eric Neeser, and we're going to be talking about being peacemakers versus peacekeepers. So you can mull on that as you go. And until then, be curious, be creative, and be compassionate, and go in peace. <laughs>